Peter. He's big. The captain. That's right. So Derek Jeter will be a Hall of Famer today. It will just become official. As I said once in his final hit at Yankee Stadium, was there ever a doubt? Or did you have a doubt? Something like that. I can't even quote myself. But um, he's one of those guys. I don't know if you look at it this way. I, I saw almost every single game he played. Now, certainly from 1996 until 2001 on the radio side, I did every game. And then once I joined, yes, I didn't do every single game, but I, I've seen mostly every game he's played. And at no time were you watching him and going, this guy's the greatest player I've ever seen. But then when you take a step back from what his career was, the sum of the parts, you do realize he's one of the greatest players who ever lived. There are only five guys in the history of baseball that have more hits than Derek Jeter. Five! He ended with 3,465 hits. He wasn't a home run hitter. You know how many home runs he had? 250. And this is the thing that jumps out at me the most. His lifetime batting average, 260, by the way, his lifetime batting average was 310. And if this doesn't tell you all you need to know about Derek Jeter, his lifetime batting average in the playoffs, which essentially was one year because he played 158 postseason games. And which is in stats. Right? Crazy. Amazing. His, his average in the playoffs was 309. So you see it even with great players. When the games become bigger and the lights become brighter, you know what happens? The game speeds up for them. They're not the same guy. Derek Jeter played postseason games the same way he played games in June. You could see by his, his output, 310, 309, there was no staggering. There was no big drop because he was in postseason games. The guy seemed like he didn't have a pulse. He wasn't the fastest runner. He didn't have the greatest arm. He didn't play with great power. He hit most of his balls to right center field. He won five gold gloves, but nobody would say he was the greatest defensive shortstop of all time. But when you put it all together, that potpourri of all the things he had, and the one thing that analytics people don't have the ability to calculate, he had that little something-something that made him yeah. one of the greatest of all time. Because there was no skill that he had, Don, that you'd say, that's the greatest thing I've ever seen. He just didn't own that skill. But when you put all of his skills together, it turned him into one of the great winners and one of the greatest players who ever lived. Yeah, you look at his war career-wise was 72.4. I don't know off the top of my head where that ranks, but I just have this feeling, Michael, that analytics wouldn't do justice to Derek Jeter. He was somebody you had to see every day. And we got to see him every day. And the nation got to see him in the playoffs because the Yankees went to the playoffs pretty much every year of his career. And how many games they played on national television. It's the New York Yankees, one of the most popular teams in North America. So how could you not see him play? But from an analytics standpoint, would he compare to the great players of all time. He would, but not defensively. And defensively is where the knock would come. Because even before the analytics, they talk about his lack of range, his arm. And all I know is he caught pretty much everything that was hit to him. Yep. All right. He made all the plays. He made all the plays that were necessary. He was an amazing leader. And do I think he would have been appreciated if he played his entire career in Kansas City and Pittsburgh? Probably not. Because you wouldn't see him every single day, and he wouldn't play on the grand stage all the time. He'd still have the hits, and he would still have a lot of the accolades uh, for the regular season. But playing for the Yankees and being seen by everyone and having that stage in the postseason pretty much every single year to come through, including that rookie year where he wins a championship, even though he played a little bit in 95, it was 96 where he came together and just never... Really, what was the last time... When was his first taste of non-playoffs after he started, right? It was 96, and then boom, they, until, they, until they missed the playoffs in uh, 2008. Yeah. I mean, that's an, that's an amazing I, run, and he was, he was pretty much uh, a, a main piece to that puzzle every single year. This is a stat I love. I bet you don't know this stat, Peter. Go ahead. Every single game that he ever played. Oh, I know, I know the stat. Except for the final game at Yankee Stadium, was he was in contention. They were in contention. That that's unbelievable. Now and and, by and that that also brings up Don's point. Uh, you could have off Broadway people that have the most beautiful voices, and do these you know shows on the road. But 
Until you play Broadway, you're not really going to get the recognition. She had to play Broadway his entire career. And now, <clears throat> I 100% agree with that. And Speaking it, of 100%. He's, his, his clutch play throughout his career, even in both in the playoffs and then even in situations like we talked about. His final game at Yankee Stadium, 3,000. Every moment, it seems like that was big. Jeter delivered in that big moment. But you also have to say that that, that being in contention stat that you put out there also is telling of the team that he was a part of his yep. entire career. Yep. You know, obviously, the, I, I can't help. I, I'm spending, I've been sitting here throughout the day going back and forth comparing Cal Ripken Jr. and Derek Jeter. And Cal got 98.53% um, of, of the eligible votes for the Hall of Fame back in 2007. Now, growing up as a kid in the D.C. area in the 80s, Cal Ripken was the biggest baseball star I ever, I ever watched in my entire life. And so, naturally, I compare those people, and I feel like Yankees fans are, are, are really big Jeter supporters, just blow right past Cal Ripken and don't put them in the same conversation. And I frankly think that's unreasonable. I think the only stat you can really use to do that is championships and amount of time you played in the playoffs. Besides that, I think you're really splitting hairs in terms of statistically. Um, Jeter has a few hundred more hits. Cal has a couple hundred more home runs. Um, you can argue about who is better in the field. I think it's Cal. Other people will say Jeter, I'm sure. Um, Cal has, of course, the streak. So, but... It, the reason I think about it is there's only one 100 percenter ever. It's Mariano Rivera. But that, that, that busted the dam. It was, it was a foolish stat. I mean, you can't tell me that Ken Griffey Jr. didn't deserve to be uh, voted on by everybody. Tom Seaver, the same deal. But there, there's a block of writers, and, and we always talk about this. They said, well, he, I don't want him to be the first 100 percent guy. So they would hold they would hold their vote back, assuming that the guy would get enough votes. But if everybody came to the same conclusion at the same time, you'd be off the yeah. ballot. You have to get 5% of the vote every time you're on the ballot. I, Otherwise, you're off the ballot. So if everybody played that cute game, you could, I mean, it, it, it was a stupid, it was a dumb thing. And I think the thing that changed it is that you had a seminal um, candidate like Mariano, but also over the years... You can't vote in anonymity anymore, for the most part. They're going to know that you're the jerk that didn't vote. And you're going to get roasted, and on social media you get roasted, and it would be a big, big deal. So the, no one wanted to be the guy who didn't vote for Mariano, right. rather than say, but, he can't be 100% guy. I think the same thing is going to hold for Jeter. It really doesn't matter at the end of the day. You can't have an argument at a bar somewhere, or on a talk show somewhere, or on one of these debate shows, and say... Derek Jeter and Mariana Rivera are the greatest players in the history of the game because they are the only two that got 100%. That doesn't no. hold water. No. Because you know what? Tom Seaver, for a long time, had the highest percentile. I don't think anybody would argue that Tom still, Seaver was the greatest player of all time or that, you know, Ken he's Griffey He's still number Jr. three ever. Right. Well, right. he might be the best pitcher of all time. Maybe. Right. Maybe. Right. You know, but is he, is he better DiMaggio, than Walter Johnson Joe or DiMaggio, Cy Young? About 100%. Joe DiMaggio didn't make it in his first try. Well, that's why there were no 100 percenters, because there were writers who said, if Joe D didn't go on to the first ballot, I'm not going to vote for this guy. Well, it's, and the whole thing is, is fundamentally flawed, right? Because when, when you don't get the votes, it doesn't mean that those people don't believe that you're a Hall of Famer. It's that they're prioritizing other people, correct? They are. I, I hate the argument. You know, I got a different look at it. I've got a different perspective. But what it comes down to, you're only allowed 10 people. And there's a log jam now on the ballot because the, the PD guys are not elected. So they're not moving off the ballot. So then it, right. it just clogs up who could, who could be voted on. But uh, that's one of the reasons that Buster only gave up his vote. He said, I'm not going to take part in this. There has to be a different voting system. You can't just limit it to 10. Hey, right. And, and to your point... Maybe there's more validity to saying, I know Jeter's getting in, so I'm not going to vote for him and use my vote for somebody else. Well, if everybody thought that way, then Jeter wouldn't get in. Right. But you Just look, vote, you period. Look, you look at this list, right, <clears throat> and there are names that when you see how many, pe how many people didn't vote for them, how can you not, you know, uh, 13 people didn't vote for Tony Gwynn to go to the Hall of Fame. A uh, joke. 16 didn't vote for Mike Schmidt. You know, Greg Maddox, 16 people were like, nah, I'm good on Greg Maddox. Right. It's impossible. These are these are people that everyone knows the Hall of Famer. So, uh, listen, I 100%, again, I keep saying 100%, believe Derek Jeter's an icon, a Hall of Famer, and I really don't have a problem with him being 100%. It's just when I look at this list, 
Should he be above these top names on the list? Is he better than Mariano? But Ken you can't Griffey look Jr., at it that way. Tom Seaver, Nolan Ryan. I, I think the Rubicon has changed because of Mariano. I think you're going to see a lot of people that are surefire Hall of Famers be 100% because it's just, it's insulting. And because now you can't do it behind the cloak of secrecy. Now you're going to be completely exposed as a D nozzle. You're going to be the guy or the couple of people or the gal that didn't vote for this guy who was a surefire Hall of Famer. And you're going to be laughed at. And with social media, you're going to be ridiculed too. But we can also appreciate on a day like this where we know he's going in just how amazing the player was. And in our generation, guys, who, who compares to him from the fact that how much he won, how successful he was on the field, and also what controversy. None. He never got in any kind of trouble. Really, so when you compare him to the other great athletes, you've got Lawrence Taylor. Well, Lawrence Taylor comes with some baggage off the field, right? Mm -hmm. You, look, you think at Eli Manning, but Eli Manning's not the surefire Hall of Famer that Derek Jeter is. Carmelo Anthony didn't play here long enough to be considered that. Henrik Lundqvist, great player, Hall of Famer, no championships. So when you look at this generation, Michael, over the last 25 years, for the, the forever players in New York, I mean, Jeter's the complete package. No, he, he is. really is. And, and he, guys, uh, I'm just being around him as much as I was for his entire 20-year career, he had an innate ability to always do the right thing. And there were opportunities for him to do the wrong thing. There was a... I'm not going to bring up the guy's name. It's not fair to make him the bad guy in the story. But there was a famous Yankee that was having a story written about him by um, New York Magazine. Okay. All right? So he was walking through the Yankee clubhouse. And the writer was trailing him taking notes of everything he said. But unless you knew that this guy was being the subject of a story, you didn't know who the guy was. He looked like any other media member. So this famous former Yankee walks by Jeter's um, um, locker, which was close to, um, right next to Thurman Munson's empty locker, which they kept in the old Yankee Stadium and right before the trainer's room. And this famous ex-Yankee said something sexist, and misogynistic that Jeter could have easily played along and said, yeah, yeah or, or just, you know, add it to what that Yankee had said. Jeter just looked and didn't say anything. And Jeter was close with this person. Didn't say a word. Didn't know anybody was listening or taking notes. The story's written. It says Derek Jeter would not join in on, you know, whatever. It would have been so easy, right? So I was just curious and I said, I walked up to him when the story came out in the magazine. I said, did you know that the writer was taking notes? He goes, I didn't even know there was a story being written. I said, then how did you know not to join in? He goes, it's not the right thing to do. He says, just not the right thing to do. How many people, even good people, would have, I mean, I mean, just for an instance, not a political statement. You think Billy Bush really agreed with what the presidential candidate was saying at the time. But you get caught up. You're trying to be You're affable. Trying to it's be a locker affable. room. It's a, it's locker, a locker room. room. And this, this is a locker room. And he didn't say it. And there's so many times where he could have made the wrong move, but every fork in the road that he came to, he, it was uncanny. It was almost eerie. He took the right turn. He never did the wrong thing. He doesn't have a stain. Playing in New York, being single, dating hundreds of women, the most beautiful women in the world. Has anybody ever said anything bad about him? Think about it. No. In this day and age, and toward the end of his career, Twitter was heating up. Social media was heating up. Never, never caught in the, the, the crosshairs. Really, the only thing you can think of, I think there was one article is something about a gift tasks, basket. And then the gift basket right. thing, which is which is nothing. The which worst is thing, nothing. The worst thing that they could come up with about Derek Jeter is that when he slept with someone, he sent them a gift basket afterwards. I don't even know if he and said that. I think even, it was just at the door. We don't, even, home we don't even know if that was true. And we, we don't know if it's yeah, true. we don't know it's but true. But even so, the worst thing is that he was, like, really polite. It's right. Like, not, not walking into an elevator with somebody. Like, it, it just, it's amazing. And then you had, the, the, the problem is that that's the way everybody's been judged moving forward. So then Alex Rodriguez comes here, and then every misstep seemed to be, well, that's opposite of what Derek Jeter would do. I mean, that's a thing. What would, De what would Derek do? What would Derek do? How do you handle the biggest spotlight in the world, a New York Yankee, while they're winning, and not one misstep, not one misspeak. I had um, a young, transcendent New York athlete ask me this a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were at an event, 
And he said, I got I to ask you something. I said, what? He goes, you were on Jeter. How did he do it? He goes, how did he do it? He said, I mean, there are cameras everywhere now. How did he do it? I said, he just, I don't know how he did it. He just did it. So you put that guy who was raised the right way and the fact that he's a transcendent talent and he does it on the biggest stage, it's just official today. I mean, he's been a Hall of Famer. I mean, he's yeah. carried himself like you a Hall it. of Famer forever. Today it becomes official. You knew it. And I, and I thought that needed to get brought up, Michael, because this is a town that, you know, chews people like that up and spits them out. And don't and you think that people were out to get him, too? Don't you think that people would have loved to see him make a misstep? Oh, and also, Michael, I, I think that you had a lot of people within the baseball community that were jealous of him and didn't like him for all the reasons we just stated. Mm -hmm. That's why whenever they would come out, Sports Illustrated would ask ball players, the five most overrated players, Jeter would always be on the list. And I always thought that it kind of came from a place of jealousy. Yep. They wish they could be Yankees. They wish they could stay out of trouble. They wish they can get the attention. Now, did he get a lot more attention because he was in New York? I, I do believe that he was in the right place at the right time with the right team. But the fact that he just ended up coming out the other side as clean as a whistle as he went in, I mean, that's amazing. an accomplishment in itself. It's amazing. And and I, I don't think it's... I, I, I told the story earlier for something that's going to be on the uh, the Hot Stove show. They're going to have a special Hall of Fame show on, on Yes after our show at 6.30. And um, the first time I ever met Derek was in 1992. He was drafted in 1992, sixth pick of the draft. And... Um, the Yankees at that time would make their first round draft pick available to the radio crew and the television crew. So they brought him up to the radio crew. Again, it was 92. It was my first year uh, on radio. And they gave me and John Sterling, Derek, for half an inning. And kind of a portent of things to come. Didn't say much. It was polite. It was very, um, uh, you know, engaging. But, you know, he wasn't telling you his life story. And I looked at him, I said, wow, he's really skinny, tall and skinny, like a t tall drink of water. And I didn't know what to make of him. Mm -hmm. And he looked so young, too. So the next day, I go down to the manager's office, and Buck Showalter is the manager at that point. I said, well, what do you think of the kid they drafted? And he goes, well, I don't know what type of player he's going to be. He said, all the scouting reports, you know, rave about him. He said, but I will tell you this, if he plays for the Yankees for 20 years... He will never embarrass the New York Yankee organization. I said, how could you tell that? He goes, I met his parents. He said, you meet the parents of a player, you can know ex exactly what that guy's going to be. He said, upstanding people, father's a doctor, mother's very involved with, with every aspect of his life. The sister is an athlete as well. He goes, he will never embarrass the Yankees. Now, one other thing. Dick Groach was the scout who um, scouted Derek in Michigan. And the Yankees were hesitant to pick him because everybody thought he was going to go to the University of Michigan. He had a scholarship to go to the University of Michigan. And George Steinbrenner at the time did not like taking high school players because they were further away from being in the big leagues. And so there was this big meeting, and um, they, they go to Dick Groach, the scout, and they, they go, well, I mean, there's a rumor that he's, not, he's going to go to the University of Michigan. And Dick Groach said, and this is legend now, he goes, he's not going to Michigan. He's going to Cooperstown. Mm. So today, it becomes official right around 6.15 during ENN. one 800 919